So, so for those who aren't familiar with the Tennessee Justice Center, we are a nonprofit public interest law firm. We basically use individual cases to identify systemic risk to state safety programs such as Medicaid, CHIP, or Cover Kids here in Tennessee, TANF, SNAP, WIC, and we do the individual casework. And then we also advocate for change through legislative action, so class action law, litigation, um, and client representation at administrative hearings. And we also advocate for these legislative changes on the state and federal level through some of our advocacy work, such as this webinar here, where we'll be talking about vaccines and the importance of them. Oh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Denson, Dr. Sinner. Hello. Can you hear us, Evan? Yes, we can hear you all. Great. Um, so I am Barb Dents, and I'm here with my twin sister, Dorothy Sennard, and um, we are so excited to be with you today um, just to chat about vaccines. Um, we are pediatricians by training. Um, we are moms, and we are also child health and safety advocates. Um, we know many of you, um, and we're excited that you're on. Um, and for those of you we don't know, we're excited to get to know you a little bit better over the next hour. Um, Dorothy, do you wanna explain what we're wearing today? Yes, I, can you see us, Heaven? Yes, I can see you all. Okay, because we can't see ourselves. And so I'm not sure what you're actually seeing in your screen, but um, I wanna explain why Barb and I, I this is Barb, I'm V, um, and we are wearing t-shirts and um, this concerned our mom this morning. So I need to explain to you why we chose to wear t-shirts. Um, uh, my t-shirt says Max up, mask up, vax up, um, and it is from Boy uh, Vaccinate Your Family. Um, and Barb is wearing it styling a summer 2021 brought to you by vaccines. And this t-shirt um, was bought to support Voices for Vaccines. Um, and so those are two of our um, allies and, um, you know, kind of national vaccine advocate friends. And so that is why we maybe look a little casual today, but we also do want this to be a casual conversation. And we hope that you all feel comfortable asking any questions that you have. And, and we just hope that we can share with you some really good information about back to school vaccines. So, all right. So Heaven, we're gonna start um, with, by showing you a movie. Um, and the reason uh, we wanted to, to share this, this is a, a little, uh, a movie that's put out um, on YouTube by the CDC um, for families about vaccines, explaining how vaccines work. And we wanted to share this with you because this is actually one of the things that we've learned that parents want the most. Um, they want good information um, about vaccines. They want to understand, but they really want to understand how they work um, in order to trust um, that this is something that they want for their kids. Um, so anyway, so we're going to share this, this short video and then talk about it in a minute. This is Baby Jack. Vaccines help Jack fight infections by introducing a small number of antigens into his body. Antigens are parts of germs that cause Jack's immune system to go to work. After Jack gets a vaccine, his immune system will remember the vaccine antigen and attack that germ if it ever invades his body again. The antigens in vaccines are weakened or dead, so they do not cause illness. Vaccines contain only a tiny fraction of the antigens that Jack encounters in his environment every day. It'll take a few weeks for the vaccines to start working, and Jack may need more doses later to best protect him. That's why Jack's parents are following the recommended immunization schedule, because it is designed to give him the best protection possible from 14 serious diseases. Learn more about childhood immunizations. Visit cdc.gov slash vaccine slash parents or talk with your child's doctor. Thank you. So um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go through a few key points from that um, from that short video. Um, first of all, um, vaccines introduce a very small amount of antigens, much smaller than um, 
than kids are exposed to naturally every day um, from the germs that are around us in our environment. Um, vaccines that we have approved for children uh, today protect against 14 different serious diseases. And as we all know, uh, COVID-19 is the latest vaccine preventable disease. Um, and it is approved, the Pfizer vaccine is approved for children 12 years and up. Um, we've got Moderna that's gonna be available soon, hopefully for that younger age group as well. Um, and, and we are anxiously awaiting um, uh, that the, a vaccine that's going to work for our younger children. Um, the uh, another point to make is that none of these vaccines actually can cause the disease uh, that you're protecting against, and that includes the COVID vaccine. Um, when people have fevers or soreness at the injection site or or other side effects, um, those are just the immune system. Uh, learning how to fight the disease. Those are, those are just a sign that the immune system is working, but that is not the disease itself. Um, you cannot get COVID from the COVID vaccine. You can't get measles from the measles vaccine. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, the reason this is important is that parents tell us that they want to understand how vaccines work. Um, and they, they are, um, they, it, it's complex, because our immune systems are complex, our bodies are complex, but it's also really simple. Um, what these vaccines do is they show our bodies a recipe um, and then our, our bodies remember how to fight these diseases. So we're protecting ourselves. The next slide, please. I think a lot of you have probably heard about herd immunity as well. Um, and we talk, this is something, herd immunity or community immunity um, is something that we talk about with childhood um, vaccines, our routine childhood vaccines a lot um, because uh, uh, diseases like measles that is incredibly contagious, um, it, it requires a very high uh, percentage of people to be vaccinated in order to protect young children, elderly, immunocompromised people, um, people who cannot get the vaccine for medical reasons um, to protect them. We need to have 95 plus percent of people immunized to keep measles from spreading in the community. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about herd immunity. Now, um, unfortunately COVID um, is a moving target. Uh, we don't know where we could reach herd immunity with um, COVID. And, and as you all know, I'm sure at this point too, we've got a new variant, the Delta variant out there, which is much more contagious. Um, so that's changing our target again. And so we're not taught, we don't talk as much, or you're not hearing people talk as much about herd immunity with COVID right now, just because we're not sure um, kind of where that mark is um, at this point. But what is important to understand is that we can still protect other people in our community. We know that children 12 and under cannot get a COVID vaccine right now. And so a way to protect them from getting COVID or from getting MISC, um, which is a, a very serious inflammatory disease that they can get um, from being exposed to COVID, uh, we, we need to protect the people around them with vaccines um, in order to protect them. So parents, older siblings who, are, who can get the vaccine, um, you know, that's a way for us to protect our young children. That's a way to protect, um, you know, immunocompromised people in our communities. So, um, so it's still an important concept for the COVID vaccine, um, but it's, more, it's something that we, that we have a better idea of where herd immunity is um, with our, our longstanding vaccines like measles and polio. Okay, next, um, next slide, please. So um, with the pandemic, we have, um, we have, as pediatricians, are really concerned because parents have been concerned about taking their kids in to see their pediatricians. Um, and because of that, we are way behind um, on our routine child immunizations. So this slide says that um, children have missed more than 11 million doses. That's in the United States. That's from the Vaccines for Children program data. 
Um, so there are many million more around the world who've missed um, routine vaccines. This concerns um, us as pediatricians. It concerns us as moms um, as well, because this means that um, when we put, are sending our kids back to school, um, so for many people that might be already or at the end of this week, um, they could be they could not be protected against some of these other diseases um, that we've been protecting them from for a long time. So um, so it is just important to realize that um, that we've got we've got a lot of work to do um, to protect our children, not just from COVID but from other vaccine preventable diseases. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit. Um, and we wanna talk about how all of us can be encouraging our families and friends um, to vaccinate their children um, and also to be vaccinated themselves. Next slide, please. Um, what, what we're uh, dealing with um, on a global scale um, with vaccines, unfortunately, is uh, a sea, uh, a tidal wave um, of misinformation that is available um, via the social media. Um, and, uh, and it is creating fear in our communities. Um, so um, I just wanna point out a report that, that some of you may have heard about. Um, the Disinformation Dozen um, is a report uh, that was put out by the CCDH, which is the Center for Countering Digital Hate. And according to this report, 73% of anti-vaccine content on Facebook comes from these 12 dozen um, leading online anti-vaxxers. Um, a point I wanna make here is that number three on that list um, are Ty and Charlene Bollinger, um, and they live in middle Tennessee. Um, and that's where this, uh, their social media and their disinformation is originating. Um, and again, this is spreading across the world. Um, and causing, um, causing needless suffering and death. Um, as uh, as Lee, um, Dr. Beers is the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and um, I heard her speak yesterday, um, and she, she made the point that misinformation robs us of our power to make the decisions that we can make to protect our families. Um, and so um, we need to be aware that it's out there. Um, next slide. So the, um, the best way that we can fight back against this infodemic that's out there is to have open, honest conversations with our own vaccine hesitant friends and family members. Um, the next slide, please. So the first thing to do uh, that we need to do, and the most important thing that we can do, and it's, it's not easy to do this first, is to listen. We need to listen to our friends and our families and hear what it is that is causing them to be afraid. Um, it is normal for people to fear new things. It's normal for people to, to fear things that they don't understand. And it's even more normal for people to get riled up when they read things that are designed to make them fearful. Um, we need to actively listen, um, be, be involved when you're, when you're talking with people and listen with empathy. Um, it's, it's, I think one of the hardest things at this point is there's a lot of anger out there. <laughs> there's a lot of just um, animosity there. there polarization, you know, all of those things. But I, I think uh, the most important thing, we have to set all of that aside and recognize that we need to, um, we need to listen and then, um, and then be able to address their individual concerns, um, not try to throw them all the information that we know and all these things that, that we think they need to hear from us um, 
but really to, to hear them and then to be able to talk to them uh, about their specific concerns. Um, the next thing that we can do is that we can share good information with them. Um, that means knowing where to find good verified sources um, and to, um, and to uh, we're, we're, going, we're going to be sharing kind of what, what some of those sources may be for you. Um, but we, we do want to um, make sure that we're getting good information so that we can share that um, with our friends and family. Um, also, um, it can be important after you ask open-ended questions um, you, to ask permission from the person that you're talking to to share what you know. Um, because if they can give you that permission, you know, it, it just in a, you know, well, you know, I've actually, I've heard something different. Would you mind, if, would, you know, would you mind if I shared with you what my understanding of this is, or would you be willing to talk to so-and-so? Because I think she knows, you know, I think she knows more about this. We were talking about it the other day, that sort of thing, but, but giving them again, the power to, to give you permission to share more information. Um, it's important to cite scientific, um, good sources, good scientific, solid um, information. Um, it's also, it can be effective to, to remind people that they're not just doing it for themselves, but they're doing that, they're doing this for maybe children in their family who are too young to be vaccinated. They're doing it for elderly folks who um, may be more at risk for severe disease. Um, you know, we're doing it for immunocompromised um, members of society um, and maybe from their own families. Um, it's important to stress the importance of getting all of the vaccine doses. Vaccines don't work. Um, most vaccines don't work with just one um, jab um, because your body learns by getting re um, re-exposed to that antigen um, over time. Um, and so it is really important to get, um, to get all of the recommended vaccine doses for all of these vaccines. Um, it's also um, important, even if someone has already had the disease, um, particularly now I'm talking about COVID, to get the vaccine. Um, we do, um, that's, that's just, it's, it, it appears to be better immunity. It appears to be longer lasting immunity. Um, and we do, it's just not safe to assume that because you you think you've had the disease or even that you've had the disease that, that you are as protected as you would be with the vaccine. And it is safe to get the, to the, vac, to get the vaccine. Um, and um, I, I, the fourth thing um, that we can all do is to explain why hopefully you've gotten vaccinated or you've gotten your kids vaccinated. And again, this applies to our routine childhood vaccines and it applies to COVID. Now it applies to other um, adult vaccines um, like shingles and the flu. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it is um, very powerful to be able to tell people that you've been vaccinated. I've been vaccinated, Dee's been vaccinated, our kids have been vaccinated, our parents have been vaccinated as soon as they were able to get them. Um, because we know that, that, is, that that's safest for all of us. Um, but I think we all have our own stories. And I think that, that be open and honest, we all had concerns before we decided to get the vaccine, <laughs> you know, and, and be honest that, you know, this isn't, of course we wouldn't want to just line up and, you know, and get a vaccine if we didn't trust um, the science behind it um, and trust that this was the best choice to keep our, our families safe. Um, so, uh, so if you can, uh, if you don't do anything else, um, think about sharing your own story about why you got vaccinated um, and why that's important for you and for your family. Um, all right, and I, I will say, um, if you can, um, if if someone changes their mind or or gives you um, you know an opportunity go ahead and help them schedule that vaccine appointment um, so that, or at least help them plan how they're going to do that because um, that 
that has been shown to be an, a, another tool that we can use to move from someone thinking, oh, okay, you know, this probably sounds like a good idea for me to actually doing it. Um, so if you can help them do that, that's great. Um, on the flip side, we all have to realize that this is a long game and most people are not gonna change their mind um, in one conversation and maybe not hearing good information from one person is not going to, is not going to change their mind. And so realize that, um, that we're in this for the long term and we need to, um, every solid good conversa conversation is important um, and don't, um, don't be discouraged, uh, but also just don't turn it into shaming or anger or anything else um, when you think you're not making headway um, because uh, this takes time um, and fear is difficult to overcome. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, I told you we were gonna give you a few um, ideas um, for some good information. And I'm sure you've all heard about the, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Center for Disease Control, um, the World Health Organization. There are plenty of, of fantastic um, uh, organizations out there. Um, sometimes uh, some of that information feels a little science-y um, when you're talking to someone who maybe isn't a, um, a vaccine um, expert isn't a scientist themselves. Um, and so here are two more, um, two more ideas of places that you can go. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, has a, a vaccine education center that is just chock full of great information that is written at parents level. It's written at, you know, a, a normal, uh, understanding of, of um, science and vaccines um, for people to really be under be able to understand. So, um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Vaccine Chop uh, Vaccine Education Center is a great resource. And then um, also Voices for Vaccines um, is a parent to parent, family to family um, organization that is also online. Um, they're in the process of completely redoing their um, platform, their website, um, but it, it's great now and it's gonna be even more spectacular by the end of the month. Um, so, um, so that's just another good kind of down to earth resource for everyone. Um, okay, and then the next slide uh, shows you um, something else that we carry in our pockets um, every day. Um, and we encourage everyone else to as well. And this is a mobile app um, that the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, or CHOP um, puts out. Uh, it's called Vaccines on the Go and, and you, it's free and you can download it to your phone. And then um, you have uh, that information at your fingertips, um, which is just is so important as well. So um, I think, uh, let's go on to the next slide. And I'm gonna turn the platform over to you. All right, Barb, thank you so much for all of that great information um, and where we can find even more great information. Um, I know that a lot of you on the call are already advocates for children's health and safety, like Barb and I are. Um, and uh, so, we also need you all to advocate for science, for vaccines, for child safety. Um, and one of the ways you can do that uh, um, is to sign petitions, right? <laughs> and so um, we, I'm president of Immunize Tennessee. Barb is, is also on the board of Immunize Tennessee. It's a statewide immunization coalition. Um, uh, that uh, we're about two years old now. Um, but in response to uh, the uh, kind of attack that uh, the, the um, vaccines have come under from our state legislatures, from um, anti-vaccination, anti-vax movements, yes, and anti-vaxxers, um, we, uh, we organized this petition um, and uh, it, it just, it is an effort to get politics out of 
um, public health. And so um, we would uh, appreciate that is still up. Um, it will be for probably another week or so before we deliver it. Um, and so we would really appreciate that. We would also love it if you would look up um, Immunize Tennessee. It's Immunize TN. Um, we are on Facebook. We are on Twitter and Instagram. Um, you can find good information there, but also um, we would love for you to share that good information. Um, uh, all, you, you know, there is good information on social media and social media can be used for good to spread good, um, sound, scientific, evidence-based information, um, but we need your help. So um, that's another way that, that you can be a vaccine champion. Please um, be an advocate um, and join our efforts. I think we can go on to the next slide. Yes, let's see if we have any questions. Actually, we'll look at, all right. I, can you all see the questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. We um, so I think we have one question from the chat. Um, if you could go over why sometimes when you get a vaccine, um, do you still get a virus like COVID? Um, I think that would be helpful. You mean, um, like a breakthrough kind of infection? Uh, yes, I, I, okay. Um, yes, um, and that's a very good question. Uh, there's not a question that's not a good question. Um, but yes, the, um, first of all, um, if, if we're gonna focus specifically on COVID, um, one of the things that's important to understand is that you, you do need a second dose and, and the vaccine isn't effective until several weeks after um, you've even gotten that second dose for the mRNA vaccines. The J and J vaccine is, is a single dose, but it is, um, but it's still, then it's two weeks. several weeks after, two weeks after that single dose before they're fully effective. Unfortunately, it's easy as humans. Um, once you get the vaccine, I felt the same way. Once I had one dose, I felt pretty invincible. Um, and and you can you can stop being as careful. And it's actually one of the most vulnerable times um, it, it is to 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 quickly um, drop the other things that you're doing to protect yourself. So people do get sick um, between the first and second doses um, of vaccines, um, and they also um, can get sick if they. Uh, if they're exposed before they've built that full immunity because that immunity builds up over time. Um, but the, the second thing to understand is that the vaccines are only 95% effective. That seems silly to say. Uh, they are 95% effective um, to prevent infection. Um, what they are 100% uh, or almost 100% effective in um, preventing hospitalization, severe illness, and death um, with the um, COVID vaccines. And so, um, so people can still, um, for whatever reason, um, you know, their, their bodies didn't, didn't mount the immune response that they had hoped or, or for whatever reason the vaccine didn't work for that small amount of people, they can, they can get infected. Um, and we do think, um, you know, and, and with the Delta variant being that much more contagious, um, you know, there may be more breakthrough infections with the Delta variant, we're not sure, but, but they're still um, very effective in preventing hospitalization and death. Um, and so that's um, super important to understand. Um, and I do see, I do see a, um, a question, just about that there are healthcare professionals out there that aren't that are spreading misinformation as well. And I would say, uh, and would we comment on that? And I would say um, there's misinformation um, coming from all sides. Um, and 
and you don't trust someone just because they say that they're a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist, um, I think you need to look at the bulk of the information and really look at the CDC, look at CHOP, look at vaccines, um, for voices for vaccines, uh, you know, look at, look at these um, larger organizations rather than looking at, at individual people and assuming that, um, that, that they're um, telling the truth um, because, um, and, and honestly, I think that the folks who have the medical knowledge to, to understand what is true and what is not, um, that's, uh, that's much more dangerous um, for them to spread misinformation um, when they have that platform um, and, and have that kind of automatic trust than people who, um, who read something on social media and, and don't know the difference between good and bad information. Um, Thank you. Do and there's we, a good question. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask probably the same question you're reading. Is, do <laughs> yeah. we have any indication of when children under 12 will be eligible for the vaccine? Um, and that's such a good question. Um, and I, I listened to a, a, a lunch webinar yesterday that was, um, which was incredibly, um, which is incredibly good, but Peter Marks, who um, is in charge of the biologic section of the FDA, um, was, was one of the people on that conference and he was, this question was posed to him. So I'm gonna give you the answer that they gave, um, they, that he gave. Um, they can't tell for sure when this is gonna be available. Um, we know that the data um, on five to 11 year olds um, is probably going to be available this fall um, and hopefully less than five, um, we may have data by early winter. Um, what that data shows is going to be what that data shows. And so if they're if they have any concerns when they look at that data and they sift through it and they do everything that they that they do, all the analysis that they do for every vaccine um, that gets approved by the FDA, even if it's for emergency use authorization, then they are going to um, they may need to send they may need to do more studies. They may need to collect more data. They, you know, they don't know. Um, and so we don't know how long it's going to take to go from the data stage to hopefully having a vaccine that has that has authorization for those younger age groups. Um, but what he did assure us, what Dr. Marks assured us, was that they are um, working as quickly as they can while still um, making sure that they are honestly um, and, and, uh, and meticulously um, going through that data so that they can be sure that this, that this vaccine for children is also safe and effective um, and is a quality vaccine. Um, and so, um, and there's, you know, uh, the data is gonna be coming really soon and, um, and then we're gonna have more to say about that, but we, we hope it's coming sooner that, rather than later. I wanna jump in here too. I 100% of I agree with everything Barb just said. The other thing to remember is that until our babies and young children, younger children can be vaccinated, the very, very best way that we can protect them is to be, get vaccinated ourselves. We need to vaccinate everybody who, can, who is eligible to be vaccinated now that's the way we're going to stop the spread of this highly contagious Delta variant. Um, and we might need also to go back on some of our, um, you know, our, our social distancing and masking protocols to, to get this under control. Um, but our vaccines are working. They are working against the Delta variant. They are still the answer to getting COVID under control. Um, and they are, like I said, again, that's the very best way that we can protect the 12 and unders at this point, or that 11 and unders. Thank you. So we have um, a question about the Delta variant. So I think it might be helpful if we can discuss what a variant is and if we're going to have to revamp or redo a vaccine um, to cover that. 
um, Delta variant that we're seeing everywhere right now. And I'm going to be honest with you, we are not um, vaccine, you know, we're not virologists or infectious disease experts, nor do, and we're not actually studying this virus itself or the vaccine, you know, we're not in the laboratory. So, um, so to some extent, the answer to this question is even uh, over, over, our over our heads. Um, so I'm going to give you a, uh, I'll give you a, um, a, a lay person's um, kind of um, answer to that question. Um, there are scientists who are a whole lot smarter than I am and a whole lot more familiar with coronaviruses um, and with vaccines um, than I am who are, um, this is their life work and and this is all they're doing um, 24 seven is, is finding, is, is looking for answers to these kind of questions. Um, whether, um, I, I think that, on the near horizon, we definitely know that people who have gotten solid organ transplants, people who've gotten liver transplants, heart transplants, kidney transplants, lung transplants, lung transplants um, those organ transplant recipients um, seem to be the least likely to be protected from two doses of the mRNA vaccines. Um, because of that, that that population of people um, may be the first population of people that they're going to rec that they may recommend a third dose. It's not a booster dose; it's a third dose in the series of vaccines for them to um, to to mount the kind of immunity that um, or some kind of immunity um, to COVID. So um, so that is. Uh, that that is probably closest on the horizon. Um, and right now the again, the delta variant itself um, does not appear to be escaping um, the vaccine or, or that we don't need to um, you know we don't need to to do anything to to um, change the vaccine at this point. Um, and again, the with, with the um, with the virus, um, the, corona, the coronavirus, COVID-19, um, SARS-CoV-2, um, it does mutate. Um, and every time someone's harboring an infection, um, the virus is, is multiplying. It's making more copies of itself. And every time it makes more copies of itself, um, there's a chance for mutation. Um, and so again, the faster we can get people vaccinated, get this virus under control so that there are fewer virus factories out there, um, infected people who where the virus is making more copies of itself, then the less um, the less variants we're gonna have. And that's that's the other argument, or that's that's the other concern that people have. Even if we if we vaccinate everyone, if we got everyone vaccinated in the United States, and we you know and we we were able to get rid of of COVID nineteen in the United States, if this virus is percolating over in Africa, um, then there are still going to be variants, and and in our world today, that those variants are going to spread around uh, around the world. So we don't we need to vaccinate. We need to get Americans vaccinated. Um, but we need to get the world vaccinated um, if we want to get this pandemic um, under control. Um, Thank you. Let's see. Just, can you think of um, any other major points that... I think something you may have covered earlier, but can you touch on who um, is able to get the vaccine in terms of um, immigration status, um, if you can afford to pay for it, all of those things, how accessible is it to everybody? That's a great, that's a great question too. Um, I, I am not, one, um, it's free for everyone in the United States. And, um, and it also, um, immigration, it, we, we need to get everyone vaccinated. And so um, uh, immigration status also does not, uh, does not matter. I am not as 
um, involved with working with some of those communities. And so, um, but, but I know that um, that's been a priority um, for our state um, and for our, um, and for our country as well, um, to make sure that that everyone who is um, eligible age-wise uh, to get the vaccine um, gets it and doesn't have to pay anything for it, including a copay, um, and that uh, none of that information, um, that vaccine, the vaccination information would be used to um, against someone who was potentially, um, you know, an, an illegal. Uh, immigrant or something like that. And so, um, but those are, that's, that's a tough, um, that's a tough wall to climb to because people are afraid of, uh, of, of coming forward to get a vaccine um, if they're concerned that they might um, lose their, lose their status. So, um, and what was, um, I, I were you ready to move on or did you want to? Well, that? I was going to say it was, Nicole, did that answer that question? I think so. And um, I just found out that Kara Holzer from Connexion Americas is on this call and has shared her phone number if anybody has any questions. So we'll put that in the chat um, if anybody needs help about um, getting um, immigrants vaccinated. Right. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Um, this is a team. <laughs> <laughs> Vaccinating, uh, the vaccine effort is absolutely a team effort. So I did, I do see um, a question. I, I see two good questions that um, that uh, that we can still address. One is um, the question of myocarditis um, and the risk of myocarditis with the, um, that we're seeing a little bit with um, the mRNA vaccines in particularly in the younger adolescents. Uh, or young adults. Um, I can say that I have some personal experience with this. I have a son who is a, uh, is a division one athlete and he got COVID um, when he returned to college last year. Um, and because he is an elite athlete, he had um, before returning to practice, and um, playing, he had to have a cardiac workup and he had elevated cardiac enzymes. And so he had to have further cardiac testing to make sure that it was safe for him to play. Um, the, that, that, um, the number one thing I want everybody to understand is that the coronavirus COVID-19 causes myocarditis quite frequently and it's very in its and it can be severe it has ended some athletes careers um the we did see a very rare side effect of the mrna vaccines we saw a couple hundred um uh young people particularly young males um get some cardiac inflammation um, from the, uh, from the appears, vaccine that, appears, that to appears to have been from the vaccines. Um, they almost in entirety, those were mild cases that they could treat with anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. Ad, like ibuprofen. Um, and they have recovered completely. Um, so Yes, there is a, yes, I do believe that there is a rare side effect of the mRNA vaccines, but we need to compare that not to, we need to compare that to getting COVID, which is far, far, far riskier in terms of getting myocarditis than um, getting myocarditis, a mild form of myocarditis from the vaccine. So, um, and can I, I'm gonna jump in here because, um, one other thing that I think is really important to understand, um, I think the other, another thought out there is, well, kids just don't get COVID. So we don't need to, why would we vaccinate children? And, um, and I think that it's important to understand that, um, you know, well over 300 children, American children have died of COVID um, in the United States. And a lot of kids, um, when they get, when they are, um, exposed to this virus don't necessarily get 
um, what we would kind of the typical COVID infection that adults are getting. Um, but what is more common in kids is this MISC, multi uh, inflammatory, multi system, multi system inflammatory syndrome of children. Um, there's also MISA, which is um, which the is what, the same thing in adults, um, but this is much more common in children. And what these kids get is inflammation of multiple um, organ systems. And so they do, they get, they can get myocarditis um, that, which is inflammation of the heart, but they also, their kidneys can shut down and their, um, they can get inflammation of their brains and they can get inflammation, you know, all over of their lungs, all over their bodies. And these kids, thankfully, um, they, they do end up in intensive care units. They do end up on ventilators, on dialysis, um, on life support. Um, but thankfully, because of the miracles of modern medicine, most of these children do not die. Um, but I just, you know, I know many of you on this call are familiar with ACEs, um, traumatic experiences in childhood. And I just want you to imagine for a moment how traumatic it is for a child and for their families to be in the intensive care unit on ventilators, on dialysis, on life support. Um, and so when we're saying that children aren't dying, which some are, that's not true, uh, that they're not dying, but these kids who are um, not dying um, are still significantly ill. Um, and we, it's just unfortunate that we're just kind of, that gets lost in the statistics um, that just because they're not dying doesn't mean that there aren't going to be long-term side effects from that illness um, physically, but um, mentally um, and, and just what this is doing is, is just frightening. Another, another point that I've, I've heard is that if this were just if, if this didn't affect adults and it wasn't making adults as sick as it is, um, or the elderly as sick it is, as it is, and it was only affecting our children the way it is right now, we would be up in arms about this childhood illness and what it's doing to kids. So it's, you know, it's, it's a relative thing that we, you know, we've like said, well, thank goodness it doesn't affect kids as much as it affects adults. It is, however, affecting kids and it is dangerous for kids and, and don't, don't get sucked down that, that trail of, of it's not a big deal for kids. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know what, I, I, I'm gonna answer an, another question. Um, just the, um, the um, FDA is probably very close to fully um, approving this vaccine. They're working as hard as they can to get through all the data and to do it again as carefully as they would, or more carefully almost than they would for any other vaccine. Um, it is important to understand that the mRNA vaccines, um, while uh, it, it is a new, um, a new platform to some extent, they have been studying these vaccines for decades, um, the mRNA technology. Um, it's new that they're that they're using it, but it's not a new. Um, it's, it's, Did you want to explain how? Uh, like we showed you that movie about how vaccines work, and really that is how mRNA vaccines work. The 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 way that mRNA vaccines work, mRNA stands for messenger RNA, and it is like the recipe um, for the antigen. Um, the mRNA codes the recipe for the spike protein antigen that gets presented in your body. So it's not a brand new, totally different way of creating immunity. It's just a new way of presenting the recipe for the antigen to your body. So, um, and it just, it's also a one way street. mRNA um, leads to protein, which is the antigen that gives you the immunity. The mRNA does not get into the nucleus of the cell. There is no way to go from messenger RNA to DNA 
to whatever. Um, so anyway, there's a whole lot of misinformation out there about that as well. But um, these vaccines have been studied for a long time. Um, the process was not rushed. Um, it was uh, it, it was done. Um, it, 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 they've been studied very carefully. Um, and I, I don't know, uh, one of the reasons that the vaccines were, a, they were able to produce them as quickly as they were, was just that they did things simultaneously um, rather than sequentially, which is what they usually do. Usually, you know, there are these different stages of vaccine development and they, would, they wouldn't be putting money into producing the vaccine until they knew for sure that they had a product that was going to work. But what they did here was they, our government um, took the risk of saying, we are going to pay um, these vaccine manufacturers to go ahead and produce these vaccines and put them in the freezer. And then and at the same time that we're studying them, and then at the end of the studies, we're going to have them available. If they're not good, if we find that there's a problem with them, we're going to throw all that vaccine away. And that's going to be money that got flushed. flushed. <laughs> but um, if they do work, and if this is going to be our road uh, map for getting out of this pandemic, then they're going to be available. We're going to be able to open the freezer. We're going to be able to put them on trucks and, and get them out to um, the people that need them. And so that's what happened. And that's, it wasn't cutting corners and it wasn't, um, it was taking a was monetary a risk, but it was not taking a medical risk at all. Um, and, and really that's how they shortened this time frame. Um, and we should all be thankful um, that those decisions um, were made um, and that this vaccine, uh, well, yes, it was produced in record time, um, but it has been incredibly well studied. And now it's been given to millions of people and billions, bill, people and billions of people around the world. Um, and so we have, uh, and we're studying, you know, um, the effects around the world. And so um, at this point, we can be so confident that these vaccines are, are truly safe. Um, the other thing that, that a lot of people, people who know a lot more about vaccines than, than I do as well, will, will tell you that um, in the past when we've had vaccines, um, it, it really is within the first several months after the vaccines are introduced that uh, we learn um, if there are significant um, problems with the vaccines. And, um, and we are well past that. And we even, we reached that you know, we, because of the sheer number of vaccines that have been given, um, we would know if they're, um, we know what, what we're dealing with at this point. So they're safe and they're safe. I, I did see another question, Barb, about side effects. And um, do you want to mention, um, you know, side effects of the disease versus the side effects of the vaccine? Um, I mean, just, you know, I guess what, what I'm getting at, I'm sorry, I, is that um, Barb just talked about like side effects of the vaccines. You usually, you know, are, usually it's when within a couple of weeks of the vaccine, certainly within a couple months. Um, but what you need to compare that to is the absolutely unknown long-term side effects of getting COVID. Like, even my son who had a mild myocarditis from having had COVID, what does that mean for him when he's 40? You know, is he at higher risk for getting an arrhythmia, an arrhythmia or having early heart disease? We don't know. Um, we know, we do know that there are a lot of people who have long-term symptoms, long haul COVID, um, and uh, you know, with autonomic, like your heart rate, your, um, respiratory rate, um, your temperature regulation, um, brain fog, um, you know, uh, just there, there are long-term complications that we're seeing from the disease itself that to me are far more concerning than um, the short-term side effects um, of the vaccine. And I feel like that the risk of the disease is 
is way, way higher than the risk of the vaccine at this point. And, and I would just add to that, the, the long-term COVID effects, um, we're also seeing that in children who maybe have asymptomatic disease, um, like they don't have any symptoms um, with the COVID um, infection itself, but we're seeing that they can show up with these long-term um, complaints um, as mental well, issues, mental so. and, and yeah. And so, um, so that as pediatricians, um, that is super concerning um, for us um, is the unknown of what these long, what the long-term effects of the COVID disease itself are going to be um, versus the, the very minimal risk um, that we're talking about with the vaccines. I don't know what time is it. I we are at noon, I believe. <laughs> so great questions, everybody. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Well, thank you all for presenting and just sharing all that information with us. And yeah, again, thank all the attendees for participating and asking all the questions. So just as a reminder, we'll distribute the slides, resources, and the recording tomorrow via email. Sign up for some of our upcoming events, including the WIC training coming up, as well as the Medicaid Masterclass, talking about household and income counting rules, MAGI and non-MAGI. And I do wanna urge everyone to check out our petition to keep kids covered across um, the US. We include things about making CHIP permanent, so the Children's Health Insurance Program, the funding permanent, making the child tax credit extension a permanent thing. And we also include postpartum coverage extension and making expanding it to 12 months of standard across all the states. So sign up for those events and sign the petition. And lastly, we will kind of be continuing this conversation, 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Central bonus Wednesday chat with Moms Rising. So join us on Twitter for that. And thank everyone for joining. You all have a good day. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.